welcome to this meeting and thank you for attending. Uh, Francesco from Tilope and I have been very pleased to organize this event, which includes a talk by William Jabotsky, Bill, the friends, you call it, <laughs> and uh, a reply by Simone Gozzano, both of whom we thank very much for coming. Um, I will now present our speakers and then just say a few things on the topic we will be dealing with today. So, William Jabotsky is Professor of Philosophy at Fordham University in New, New York City. His research interests include philosophy of mind, metaphysics, and philosophy of religion, in which he wrote a range of papers. And he's also the author of the Blackwell Introduction to Philosophy of Mind, and of a book part of which he will be talking about this morning, that is, Structure and the Metaphysics of Mind, how Hylomorphism solves the mind-body problem, which has been published recently in 2016 by OUP, uh, where he argues for a pro-physical, anti-reductive and hylomorphic account of biological and mental states and activities. And then we have Simone Gozzano, who is Professor of Logic and Philosophy of Science at the University of L'Aquila. His areas of specialization are philosophy of mind, metaphysics and epistemology. Currently, uh, Simone is working on metaphysical themes such as the nature of properties and dispositions, mental causation, and the type identity of the theory of mind. And recently, he wrote an introductory text on consciousness and a book on metaphysics and mental properties and the mind body problem. Together with Christopher Hill, he is the editor of New Perspectives on Type Identity, published by CUP in 2012 a book which defends the thesis that the one range of mental states are... Uh, I more, I presenting more me than him. I mean, oh, no, this, this, this tells you what I'm dealing with here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so a wide range of mental states are identical with physical states of the brain. So we have good starting points for a lively debate, I think. And now I know all about you. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know if you're a Taurus or not. And now that's it. <laughs> And moreover, for the matter for discussion, uh, may arise also by considering the relation between Bill's proposal and ancient thought. Uh, indeed, the hylomorphic theory uh, that Bill will um, uh, propose us today uh, is inspired by Aristotle's uh, hylomorphism and draws on some central insight of Aristotle's theory. In particular, Bill's hylomorphic theory is among the latest outcomes of uh, a revival of Aristotle's hylomorphism, which is in modern times dates back to Putnam's and Nussbaum's cohort paper on this topic. So the new hylomorphism proposed <coughs> by Bill uses some selected parts of Aristotle's theory, which, if considered in its entirety, we, we cannot longer believe. So Bill's proposal, like any other revival, I think, faces some compatibility and adjustment problems that perhaps may be worth taking, tackling in the general discussion that would follow the two talks. So I look forward with very much to hearing the two speakers and it's time to start. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. I really enjoyed my time in Rome and I'm looking forward to us talking about this stuff together. So the late Hilary Putnam was one of the most influential philosophers of the last century. One of his best known contributions was the formulation of functionalism, which quickly became the dominant account of mental phenomena in philosophy. But just when functionalism was becoming popular, Putnam showed his characteristic independence of mind and rejected the view. He remained convinced of two things. First, that we are physical beings whose capacities are essentially embodied in the physical mechanisms that compose us. And second, that physics, chemistry, and neuroscience cannot yield exhaustive accounts of what we are and what we can do. But in looking to articulate a pro-physical, anti-reductive view along these lines, he distanced himself from the information processing models of cognition that had informed his earlier thinking and found inspiration in a new source, Aristotle. Together with Martha Nussbaum, he co-authored a well-known paper that renewed interest in the idea that Aristotelian hylomorphism might provide resources for solving mind-body problems. It would nevertheless take several decades for Putnam and Nussbaum's idea to become more than a mere suggestion. Contributing to an area like philosophy of mind requires formulating theories in a way that make it evident how they solve the problems with which philosophers working in those areas are concerned. And it was unclear to most philosophers of mind exactly what hylomorphism claimed and exactly how it could solve mind-body problems. The difficulty was abetted 
by specialists in ancient philosophy who couldn't agree on exactly what Aristotle's psychology was. Some claimed it was a form of substance dualism or dual attribute theory. Others claimed it was a version of the psychophysical identity theory. Functionalism, neoparallelism, even panpsychism. And yet others claimed that Aristotle endorsed a view that was ultimately incoherent, or perhaps more charitably, that waffled between incoherence and non-reductive physicalism. Given the divergence of opinion among specialists, philosophers of mind could see little value in studying Aristotle's psychology. Not only was it unclear what it claimed, but whatever it claimed, they were assured by the experts that it was a theory of some already familiar sort. Why then look to a figure separated from us in time, and more importantly, conceptual space? A figure who wrote in a defunct language that was difficult to decipher both in translation and in the original, who lived before the scientific revolution, and whose ideas on so many topics had been proven false by the enhanced methods for studying the natural world that the revolution introduced. Why turn to Aristotle, moreover, when it was so much easier to look to contemporary exemplars of whatever kind of view he must have endorsed? The results shouldn't be surprising. Aristotle himself noted that we understand things initially in terms of what is better known to us. And what is better known to contemporary philosophers are ways of conceptualizing things, thinking of things that have been inherited largely from Descartes. Little wonder if even specialists have trouble understanding a pre-Cartesian view. It was the elaboration of Aristotelian themes in metaphysics, particularly work on powers and composition, that ultimately enabled Nussbaum and Putnam's idea to be more than a mere suggestion. I'll return to this momentarily. But first, let's return to what many philosophers took to be, and what many still take to be, the more basic problem. All things being equal, philosophers probably shouldn't endorse views that are incompatible with our best science. Given the widespread dismissal of Aristotle's views as unscientific, it makes sense to ask whether they really are, and if so, whether it's possible to reformulate his central ideas in a way that renders them, or something very much like them, scientifically respectable. When it comes to the central notion of hylomorphic form, Marjorie Green saw a similarity with the notion of organization at home in biology. Quote, ADOS functions in a number of striking respects in the same way as the concept of organization in modern biology. The ADOS of an entity or process is its organizing principle, the way it works to organize some substrate. Form in nature exists in and only in that which it informs as the organizing principle in an appropriate manner. The matter is by no means to be ignored. It can be studied with profit for itself, as modern biology studies, in much greater exactitude than Aristotle could dream of, the physical-chemical substrate of living systems. But the form, too, can be studied for its own sake, as it is by modern systems theorists, even though it exists only as enmattered and depends for its existence and continuance on the laws governing the matter of which it is the form. ADOS, in the sense of organizing principle, is a definitive concept for biological method, though its modern counterpart is couched in different terms." End quote. To illustrate Green's point about the notion of organization in modern biology, consider an example from a popular uh, college-level biology textbook. I guess you don't call it co college here. Collegio is high school, right? So here it's, it's university, right? Yeah. So this is taken from a university-level textbook. Life is highly organized into a hierarchy of structural levels, with each level building on the levels below it. Biological order exists at all the levels. Atoms are ordered into complex biological molecules. Those molecules are arranged into minute structures called organelles, which are in turn the components of cells. Cells are in turn subunits of organisms. The organism is not a random collection of individual cells, but a multicellular cooperative. Identifying biological organization at its many levels is fundamental to the study of life. With each step upward in the hierarchy of biological order, novel properties emerge that were not present at the simpler levels of organization. A molecule such as a protein has attributes not exhibited by any of its component atoms, and a cell is certainly much more than a bag of molecules. If the intricate organization of the human brain is disrupted by a head injury, that organ will cease to function properly, 
And an organism is a living whole greater than the sum of its parts. We cannot fully explain a higher level of order by breaking it down into its parts. So this passage suggests that organization, or order, or structure, or configuration, whatever you want to call it, is something real. It's a real ontological and explanatory principle. That is, it plays an important role in things being what they are and in explaining what those things can do. This idea is echoed by other scientists and by some philosophers. So I won't quote all of them. Um, here, here are the names of just some of them. Um, maybe just Ernst Mayer. So quote, all biologists recognize no supernatural or immaterial forces, but only such that are physical chemical. The modern biologist rejects in any form whatsoever the notion that a vital force exists in living organisms which does not obey the laws of physics. All processes in organisms strictly obey these physical laws. But biologists do not accept the naive mechanistic explanation of the 17th century. And they disagree with the statement that animals are nothing but machines. Where organisms differ from inanimate matter is in the organization of their systems. Organisms have many characteristics that are without parallel in the world of inanimate objects. The explanatory equipment of the physical sciences is insufficient to explain complex living systems." End quote. <coughs> so here we find the combination of ideas that Putnam and Nussbaum found so compelling. Essential physical embodiment together with anti-reductionism. Elsewhere, I've argued that if we look carefully at the literature in biology and biological subdisciplines such as neuroscience, we can isolate the theoretical roles, the jobs, that many scientists expect the notion of organization to perform. To express those roles, we can use a few slogans. So first, structure matters. It operates as an irreducible ontological principle, one that accounts at least in part for what things essentially are. Second, structure makes a difference. It operates as an irreducible explanatory principle, one that accounts at least in part for what things can do, the powers that they have. And third, structure counts. It explains the unity of composite things, including the persistence of one and the same living individual through the dynamic influx and efflux of matter and energy that characterize many of its interactions with the wider world. These roles, I've argued elsewhere, jointly yield a notion of organization or structure very much like Aristotelian form. That notion, moreover, has a solid empirical basis one that can be expressed in terms of a commitment to ontological naturalism. <coughs> ontological naturalism is the claim that when it comes to determining what exists, empirical investigation, paradigmatically science, is our best guide. It can be understood as a conjunction of a broadly Quinean thesis about ontological commitment with a broad empiricism. The broadly Quinean thesis maintains that we are committed to all the entities postulated by our best descriptions and explanations of reality. And the broad empiricism maintains that our best descriptions and explanations of reality derive from empirical sources, such as the natural and social sciences. Suppose we take the natural language sentences in which our best descriptions and explanations are formulated and reformulate them in a quantifier variable idiom the way Quine suggests. In that case, says the Quinean thesis, we would be committed to the existence of all the entities needed to make those descriptions and explanations true. Now, ontological naturalism implies that if our best descriptions and explanations posit entities of a certain kind, K, then we have good reason to think that those entities, those Ks, exist. Consider, then, empirical descriptions and explanations that posit various kinds of organization or structure. If ontological is natu naturalism is true, those descriptions and explanations give us good prima facie reason to think that those structures exist. They therefore make of us a serious ontological demand. So although there are several ways of trying to meet this demand, the most straightforward way takes empirical claims about structure at face value. It says that structure really is an irreducible ontological and explanatory principle. And that this is what makes descriptions and explanations that appeal to structure true. This straightforward realist approach is the one favored by hylomorphous, at least hylomorphous of the sort that I have in mind. 
What sort exactly is that? The past two decades have seen renewed interest in Aristotle among metaphysicians, a development that, I've suggested, has finally made it possible to reformulate Aristotelian solutions to live problems in philosophy of mind. But not all recent formulations of hylomorphism are created equal. Those which are formalistic have less potential to contribute than those which are naturalistic. So here's a rough impressionistic way of distinguishing the two. Formalistic hylomorphic theories, such as those defended by Kit Fine, Mark Johnston, and Catherine Kozlicki, can be seen as taking a cue from the first part of this passage from Aristotle's Metaphysics, while ignoring the second part. <laughs> So, quote, some things are said to be by bringing together their matter. For example, some things are said to be by mixing, such as honey water. Others by tying, such as a bundle. Others by gluing, such as a book. Others by nailing, such as a box. Others by more than one of these. Others by position, such as a threshold or lintel. Others by time, such as dinner and breakfast. Others by location, such as the winds. Others by their perceptible features, such as hardness and softness, thickness and thinness, dryness and wetness. Clearly then, is, is said in just as many ways. So here Aristotle suggests that there are many ways of taking a number of different things to be one, to form a single whole. Unlike Aristotle, however, who says that being is said in many ways, formalistic varieties of hylomorphism take being to be said in only one way. If thresholds and humans both exist, then they exist in exactly the same sense. As a result, formalistic hylomorphic theories are characterized by expansive ontologies, which comprise many objects that defy common sense, even more than ontologies based on principles of unrestricted composition. So Fine tells us, quote, there are many more material objects than is commonly supposed. We're familiar with the prodigious ontology of the Mariologists, according to which any occupied region of space-time, no matter how scattered or gerrymandered, will determine a material object. But this is nothing compared to the ontology of the present view. For to each such object of the Mariologists, there will correspond a multitude of rigid embodiments and a multitude of variable embodiments. The flat, unstructured objects of the Mariologists represent a mere fraction of what there is." End quote. Naturalistic hylomorphic theories, by contrast with the formalistic ones, can be seen as emphasizing that Aristotle's equivocation on being is not unsystematic, but is instead cross headed <coughs> toward one. The various equivocal senses of being are united by reference to a univocal core. In the strictest sense, it's substances that are beings. To say that there are beings in any other sense entails in one way or other that there are substances. If anything in Aristotle's metaphysics maps onto the contemporary univocal notion of being, it's the notion of being that applies to substances. According to Aristotle, however, substances exist by nature. Naturalistic varieties of hylomorphism, such as those defended by Mike Ray and myself, take the idea of nature seriously, either in the form of a simple constraint that hylomorphic structures carve nature at its empirically discoverable joints, or in the form of a more robust principle like ontological naturalism. In line with this naturalistic orientation, naturalistic hylomorphic theories typically take structures to be powers. So just to um, give an intuitive idea of what hylomorphic structure is supposed to be, um, Suppose we, we, we take Simone and we put him in a, a bag, a very strong bag, because we want to make sure that nothing leaks out when we squash him with several tons of force. So there's a difference in the contents of the bag before the squashing and after the squashing. Before the squashing, the contents of the bag include one human being. After the squashing, they include none. Before the squashing, the contents of the bag can think and feel, and perceive, and act. After the squashing, they can't. What's the difference in the contents of the bag pre-squashing and post-squashing? It's not a difference in the materials. Very same materials. That's why we use the very strong bag. We didn't want any of the materials to leak out. The difference isn't in the materials. 
It's in the way those materials are organized or structured. That organization or structure made it the case that the contents included a human being. When that structure got destroyed, there was no longer a human being there. That structure is also responsible for the powers that that human being had, for that human's ability to think and feel and perceive and act. Once that structure gets destroyed by the squashing, those powers get destroyed as well. Structure, then, is an ontological principle. It concerns what things are, makes human, for instance, and it concerns, it's an explanatory principle, too. It concerns what things can do. And so that's the basic notion of, of hylomorphic structure. It's that that kind of structure is a real thing, just, just, like, just like materials, just as real as materials. Okay, but what are structures? Um, there are, uh, on, on the view that I endorse, and on the view of naturalistic <coughs> hylomorphists like uh, Mike Ray and Adam Amadoro, uh, structures are powers. Now, there are many different theories of powers in the literature. Elsewhere, I've argued that the, the theory that has the most going for it is a version of the identity theory of powers that's been defended by C.B. Martin and John Hyatt. According to the identity theory of powers, properties are essentially dispositional. Each essentially empowers its individual possessor to interact with other individuals in various kinds of ways. A diamond's hardness empowers it to do a variety of things. To scratch glass, for instance. We describe this power conferring role in many different ways. We say that the diamond is hard, that the diamond is able or has the power or potential or capacity to scratch glass, or that the diamond would scratch that window if raked across its surface. These different vocabularies create the impression that there are different kinds of properties, dispositional properties and categorical properties. But according to the identity theory, these vocabularies describe the very same properties. They just represent different ways of thinking about those properties, ways that make explicit or leave implicit the various theoretical roles that those properties play. Dispositional descriptions such as the diamond would scratch that window if raked across its surface, bring out the roles that the diamond's hardness plays as a power. Non-dispositional descriptions, such as the diamond has a tetrahedral arrangement of carbon atoms, bring out the property's role as a stable manifestation or actualization of the power that the carbon atoms have to be arranged tetrahedrally. The one property is thus simultaneously both a stable manifestation of a power and a power itself, both an actuality and a potentiality. Now, the identity theory of powers has several noteworthy features. First, it claims that powers are essentially directed toward their manifestations. And this directedness has led some philosophers to draw analogies between dispositionality and intentionality. So intentional mental states are said to be directed at things. My desire is essentially a desire for something. My fear is essentially a fear of something. Something analogous is true of powers. They are essentially powers for various manifestations. The property of fragility, for instance, is essentially directed toward breaking. Likewise, just as my um, fear or my desire can remain unfulfilled, so too a power can remain unmanifested. A quantity of table salt has the power to dissolve in water, but it might never actually be dissolved. And a fragile vase might never actually break. Another feature of the identity theory is that powers are manifested only in specific circumstances, and typically only in conjunction with individuals that have reciprocal powers what Martin calls reciprocal disposition partners. Powers have to work together. Powers can be manifested both actively and passively, both in the ways that individuals affect things and in the ways that they're affected by them. In general, powers are only manifested when individuals with reciprocal powers are conjoined in the right circumstances. Take an example. Water can exercise its power to dissolve things only in conjunction with things that have the power to be dissolved by it, and they have to be joined in the right circumstances. In addition, the same power can manifest itself differently in conjunction with different disposition partners. 
So to use Heil's example, a ball will roll on a hard surface on account of its roundness. And it will make a concave depression in a soft surface on account of that same hardness. Likewise, the diamond's hardness empowers it to scratch glass and also to scratch jade. And the batter's power to hit a baseball 400 feet also empowers him to hit a bigger, heavier softball only 300 feet. Given a view of powers along these lines, hylomorphic structures can be understood as powers to organize or to configure or order or coordinate things. What sets hylomorphic structures apart from other powers is that they cannot exist unmanifested. They are reflexive manifestors, their own reciprocal disposition partners. So they're manifested essentially. Structured individuals, such as you and I, are essentially and continuously engaged in configuring the materials that compose them. I configure the materials that compose me. You configure the materials that compose you. Our continuous structuring activity explains our unity and our persistence through time, through the dynamic influx and efflux of matter and energy that characterize our interactions with the surrounding world. This is what it means to say structure counts. It explains the unity of composite things. It explains how many different things, like little physical particles, form one thing, one cohesive whole. The resulting view of composition is very similar to Peter Van Inwagen's. Hylomorphists claim that composition occurs when and only when an individual structures materials. Composite individuals are emergent individuals on the hylomorphic view. There are empirically describable conditions that are sufficient to bring into existence new structured individuals where previously no such individuals existed. How do we know which arrangements of physical materials correspond to genuinely emergent individuals and which don't, which are mere arrangements of physical materials? Here, hylomorphists follow Peter Van Inwagen. Structured individuals have non-redundant causal powers that mere arrangements of physical materials do not have. There's nothing going on in this region that we take to be occupied by a table that cannot be exhaustively described and explained by appeal to physical materials alone. To know what's going on here, you just have to describe the physical particles and how they're spatially arranged. You don't need to talk about any other powers. But living things like us, are capable of doing things that can only be done by unified composite wholes. And because of that, we're forced to grant that wholes like us exist. Now, emergent individuals have properties of at least two sorts. First, there are properties due to their structures or their integration into individuals with structures. And there are properties due to their materials alone, independent of the ways they are structured. So subatomic particles, atoms and molecules have physical properties, such as mass, irrespective of their surroundings. <clears throat> but under the right conditions, they can contribute to the activities of living things. <clears throat> Nucleic acids, hormones, and neurotransmitters are examples. They're genes, growth factors, and metabolic and behavioral regulators. Each admits of two types of descriptions. They can be described in terms of the contributions they make to a structured system but they can also be described independently in non-contribution-oriented terms. Descriptions of the former sort express the properties characteristic of structured individuals, such as organisms and their parts. Descriptions of the latter sort express the properties things have independent of their integration into structure holes. <clears throat> so a strand of DNA might always have various atomic or fundamental physical properties, regardless of its environment. But it gets new properties. <clears throat> it has different powers or manifests different powers when it gets integrated into a cell and begins making contributions to the cell's activities. It becomes a gene, the part of the cell that plays a role in, say, protein synthesis. <clears throat> Another way of bringing out this distinction between the two kinds of properties is the thing again about the squashing example. So the contents of the bag, they have the same mass before the squashing and after the squashing. So Simone's mass is independent of the way those materials are structured. 
but his powers to think and feel and perceive and act, those got destroyed when the structure got destroyed. So those are powers that depend on the structure. So some properties depend on structure, others don't depend on structure. And these are just two different kinds of properties that things have. So, some philosophers uh, call the new properties that are acquired by a structured system emergent properties. And they have three characteristics. They're first order properties, uh, that is they're not higher order properties, they're not mere logical constructions or abstractions um, with spe special kinds of definitions. They're instead powers in their own right. Second, they're not epiphenomenal. They actually make a difference to the things that have them. And third, they're possessed by an individual because of its structure or organization. Notice it's not a feature of emergent properties on the hylomorphic view that they're produced or generated by the lower level stuff. This is a claim that's endorsed by classic emergentist theories like C.D. Broad's, where the physical material squirt out the new powers. That's not the hylomorphic view. Um, the new powers, they're just new. They're different from the powers of the physical materials by themselves. But the physical materials don't produce or generate the new powers. Okay, so on the hylomorphic view, structure is a basic ontological and explanatory principle. It concerns what things are and what they can do. Once a structured individual comes into existence, it's essentially and continuously engaged in configuring materials. That activity is what unifies various materials into one single whole. And it does that unifying work synchronically and also diachronically over time. And it's also what confers on that individual distinctive powers that the physical materials by themselves don't have. Describing the way a structured individual configures its materials, the materials composing it, is something that scientists, or that, that hylomorphists say, is a job for scientists. So we talk to the biologists, the biochemists, the neuroscientists, uh, and they're the ones who tell us how we go about structuring these materials and what our distinctive structures are. Okay, now, so far I've been talking about composite individuals and their structures. We can just call these individual making structures. They're the kinds of things that medieval hylomorphists called substantial forms. But individuals are not the only composite entities on the hylomorphic view I've been describing, nor are individual making structures the only structures. There are composite events as well. The activities in which structured individuals engage, those have structures too. We can just call those activity making structures. So the activities of structured individuals involve coordinated manifestations of the powers of their parts. So we have parts, and our parts have powers too. My hand can do this, my head can do this, and so on. When we walk, or talk, or sing, or dance, or run, or jump, or do the various activities we do, we impose an order or structure on the way these parts manifest their powers. It's possible for my neurons to fire, or my muscles to contract, in ways that do not compose an activity say, an activity of throwing a baseball or playing an instrument. <clears throat> Fatigue, injury, insufficient training, and many other factors can result in uncoordinated manifestations of the powers of my parts. But when I succeed in throwing a baseball or playing an instrument, I succeed in imposing a structure, an order, a coordination on the way my parts, and in many cases surrounding materials, surrounding things as well, manifest the powers that they have. I structure their powers throwing-wise or playing-wise. In some cases, the structuring is conscious and intentional, as when I throw a baseball, or when I produce the precise limb movements involved in a dance. But in many cases, the structuring is neither conscious nor intentional, as in digesting food, or increasing blood flow to the legs in response to something fearful. In whatever way it occurs, whether consciously and intentionally or not, the result of the structuring is not a new individual, but rather an activity. It's another manifestation of the power that beings like us have of imposing order on things. Now, activity-making structures unify diverse events 
in the same way that individual making structures unify diverse physical materials. The very same muscle fibers that contract in my shoulder when I throw a baseball might also contract when I experience an uncontrolled muscle spasm or when a physical therapist stimulates them electrically. What unifies or coordinates the contractions of the muscle fibers, along with changes in surrounding things, is what I do when I try to make it out or try to knock down cans at the county fair or try to accomplish whatever I do when I throw a baseball. In performing these activities, I impose a unified order on the way my parts and surrounding things manifest their powers. Now, on the hylomorphic view I've been describing, structured activities include thinking, feeling, perceiving, and intentionally acting. When, for instance, I experience an emotion, I'm engaging in an activity. It's an activity in which various parts of my nervous system and various objects in the environment are coordinated, they're manifesting their powers in a coordinated way, and that coordination unifies them into a single event. It's possible to describe the unifying role of activity-making structures in terms of a notion of activity composition, analogous to the notion of composition for individuals. So just as physical materials compose an individual exactly if they have the right kind of individual-making structure, uh, likewise, an individual um, engages in an activity exactly as it coordinates the, um, the manifestation of the powers of its parts in the right kind of way. So, take an example, I throw a baseball exactly as my parts and surrounding materials manifest their powers throwing a baseball wise, in a, in a throwing a baseball way. <clears throat> Similarly, I experience anger or enjoyment exactly as my parts and the surrounding things manifest their power in an angrier kind of way. Anger-wise, enjoyment-wise. Given reasonable assumptions, activity composition implies that the behaviors of structured individuals never violate the laws governing their fundamental physical components. According to hylomorphism, the activities of structured holes are composed of the structured manifestations of the powers of their lower level components and the surrounding materials. If those components or the materials were to lose their powers, or were to become incapable of manifesting them, they would become incapable of composing the activities in which we engage. By analogy, it's only because bricks and timbers retain their shapes under compression that they can be recruited to be parts of buildings. Likewise, it's only because lower level physical materials retain their distinctive powers that you and I can recruit them as components for our bodies and for our activities. This is one thing that sets the hylomorphic view apart from classic emergentist theories like Roger Sperry's, which claim that the new emergent powers trump or nullify the powers of the original things. Activity composition also makes it clear in what sense a structured individual has the power to engage in activities because of its parts. Those parts form a subset of the individuals with powers whose coordinated manifestations compose its activities. We can just say that an individual's parts embody its powers. My visual system embodies my power to see. Your circulatory system embodies your power to bring oxygenated blood to various parts of yourself. Gabriel's limbic lobe embodies his power to experience emotions, and so on. Now, according to the hylomorphic theory I've been describing, all the powers of structured individuals are essentially embodied in their parts. The activities in which they engage are essentially composed of coordinated manifestations of the powers of those parts and surrounding things. It's impossible, not just nomologically, but metaphysically, for me to throw a baseball unless my parts are coordinated in the right way. Likewise, it's impossible, not just nomologically, but metaphysically, for Gabriel to experience anger or enjoyment if his parts don't manifest their powers in the right coordinated way. This is, a, this is a claim that's rejected by many hylomorphists. They think that the power of thought or understanding is not embodied in physical materials. That's, that's not the kind of view that I endorse. All of our powers are embodied essentially in physical materials. So on the hylomorphic view, thought, feeling, perception, and action are essentially embodied in the physical and physiological mechanisms that compose us. The reason, um, and yet, it's not possible to reduce 
explanations of thought and feeling and perception to descriptions and explanations of just the physiological mechanisms. The reason is that there's more to these activities on the hylomorphic view than just those mechanisms. There's also the way the activities of those mechanisms are coordinated or organized or structured. And structure in general is something different from things that get structured. It's possible for parts of our nervous systems to be activated in the ways they are when we are experiencing an emotion, even though we're not experiencing an emotion in fact. Patients with a condition called pseudovulvar affect suddenly and unpredictably cry or laugh in ways that are indistinguishable from the ways they would uh, laugh or cry if they were experiencing sadness or mirth, and yet they don't feel sad or amused. Parts of their nervous systems are activated in the ways they would be during a real emotional episode. Yet, that activation fails to be coordinated in the right way necessary to compose an emotion. So the hylomorphic view is robustly anti-reductive, even though it's committed to essential physical embodiment. Okay, now with that stuff in mind, let's turn to mind-body problems. Consider the problem of emergence, the problem of explaining how lower level physical or physiological mechanisms can generate or produce higher level mental phenomena like thoughts and feelings and perceptions. How is it that, say, the tiny particles in my brain can give rise to the rich qualitative experiences that I have? Critics argue that views like the one that Putnam wanted, that are pro-physical yet anti-reductive, they argue that there's, they have no satisfactory answer to this question. <coughs> the typical responses, such as brute psychophysical laws, or panpsychism, or panprotopsychism, they all have very serious problems. So what do hylomorphists say? Well, from their perspective, hylomorphists say that the problem of emergence can arise only for a worldview that rejects hylomorphic structure. So structure carves out distinctive individuals from the otherwise undifferentiated sea of matter and energy that's described by our best physics. And it confers on those individuals distinctive powers. So if hylomorphic structure exists, the physical universe is punctuated with these pockets of organized change and stability. Composite physical objects, such as you and I, whose structures confer on them powers that distinguish what they can do from what unstructured materials can do. Those powers include the powers to think, feel, and perceive. A worldview that rejects hylomorphic structure, by contrast, lacks a basic principle to distinguish the parts of the physical universe that can think, feel, and perceive from those that can't. And without a principle that carves out the zones with distinctive powers, the existence of those powers can start to look inexplicable and mysterious. If there is nothing built into the basic fabric of the universe that explains why zone A has the powers to think and feel and perceive, while zone B can't. Uh, if nothing explains why you can think, feel, and perceive, while the table and the air and the materials surrounding you can't do those things, then the options for understanding the existence of those powers in the natural world starts to look sort of uh, strange, mysterious. And the options are very constrained. So either those powers have to be identified with the powers of physical materials themselves, taken by themselves or in combination, which is what panpsychists and many physicalists claim. Or their existence must be taken as an inexplicable matter of fact, as many emergencies and epiphenomenalists claim. Or their existence in the natural world has to be denied altogether, as substance dualists and eliminative physicalists claim. But if there's hylomorphic structure, then the options are no longer constrained in this way. Distinctive powers like yours and mine exist in the natural world because structure exists in the natural world. So, according to hylomorphists, it's illegitimate even to request an explanation of how lower level factors give rise to higher level phenomena. It's legitimate to request an explanation of how it's possible that P only if it is possible that P. And according to Hylomorphus, it's not possible for lower level physical or physiological occurrences to produce thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. The reason is that Hylomorphism denies that emergent properties are generated or produced by lower level processes or states. 
According to Hylomorphus, higher level phenomena are ways in which lower level occurrences are structured. And structures in general are not generated or produced by the things that they structure. Brains don't generate thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and actions. Thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and actions are instead ways that the powers of brains and other things get coordinated or structured. The powers that think, feel, and perceive are embodied in muscular contractions and neural firings and other physiological occurrences. But they're not generated or produced by those occurrences. For on the hylomorphic view, structured things are in general just no, they're not causal byproducts of the things that they structure. Requesting an explanation of how lower level occurrences generate higher level phenomena thus misunderstands the hylomorphic notion of structure. It assumes, contrary to hylomorphism, that structure is not a basic principle, but instead something that is derived from lower level materials. Consequently, demanding that hylomorphists explain how brains produce consciousness implicitly begs the question against their view, for it assumes the existence of a kind of occurrence that hylomorphists say doesn't exist, namely the generation of higher level phenomena by lower level occurrences. So on hylomorphous own terms, it's not legitimate to request an explanation of lower level generation, any more than it's legitimate to ask a meteorologist to explain how the will of Zeus produces rain. Opponents of hylomorphism are free to reject the hylomorphic view. But within the hylomorphic framework itself, requesting an explanation of how lower level phenomena generate higher level phenomena is illegitimate. Moreover, the very fact that the problem of emergence arises for opponents and not for hylomorphists, that's something that weighs in favor of hylomorphists. They, have, they don't have a problem that their opponents have. Now, hylomorphists don't deny that we can ask how particular structures came to be in place. It's legitimate to ask how my human structure came to inform these materials. The answer has to do with my parents' reproductive activity. Likewise, it's a legitimate scientific endeavor to try to discover how the first living things emerge. That is, how the first living structures came to inform various prebiotic materials. What's not legitimate to ask on the hylomorphic view is what's responsible for continually generating the structures that you and I have. My structure is not something that I continuously generate or that's generated by my materials or by some external source. It's instead a self-maintaining, configuring activity in which I am always uh, and essentially engaged. There's no sense then in which Hylomorphus refusal to answer a request to explain emergence can count as a strike against the view, at least not without begging the question and assuming at the start that Hylomorphism is false. Now, what I've briefly outlined in this talk is an empirically based hylomorphic theory that implies a solution to a live problem in the philosophy of mind. There's clearly a great deal more to be said, and elsewhere I've described the theory in much greater detail, and Sean and I can actually solve other mind-body problems, including the problem of mental causation and the problem of other minds. Uh, I nevertheless hope that I've said enough here simply to indicate, if only in a rough way, how a hylomorphic framework can solve mind-body problems. The revival of Aristotelian themes in metaphysics over the past two decades has succeeded in challenging deep-seated Cartesian and Humean assumptions about the natural world. As a result, it has positioned philosophers in the 21st century more favorably than at perhaps any time since the scientific revolution to reclaim the central insights of Aristotelian philosophy. Only time will tell if hylomorphism really does provide a satisfactory framework for solving the problems bequeathed to us by Descartes and his successors. It may not be Hilary Putnam's best advertised idea, but it may end up being his most important. Thank you. <coughs>
Are you resisting, guys? Are you yeah. Okay? <laughs> I have bisogno del. Yeah, even if my. I don't have a fancy presentation, may I snitch your. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Oppure oh, ho io una pennetta per poi. Ah, okay. That's alright. interesting and uh, absolutely uh, packed of ideas presentation. So I, I will, I have not uh, a very organized um, comment, I have a number of questions and problems that I wish to raise, uh, even if I will try to sue them in a sort of presentation-wise kind of uh, um, uh, comment. Uh, my first purpose, so I, I, if I got the problem right, the, the picture right, um, Bill claims that helomorphism is a, basically a two view, two, two points view. One is uh, the notion of the principle of unity and the other the notion of being. And uh, he, he claims that in his view these are sparse in terms of the principle of unities. Uh, univocal is the notion of being that he wants to endorse. And the principle of unity are those that will allow us to understand what a structure is, uh, which to me being a little bit worried about the way in which you conceive your discussion, that is to crush them in a the bag. But anyway, um, so we want to um, differentiate things that are structure or that are structure from things that are not. And presumably, the crushed man um, example is one that should give us a hint and an idea of what a structure is. We know that after the crushing, I am not anymore able to think, to feel, and to do whatever is supposed to be the result of my being a structure of the, re of the structure itself, which is something that I would uh, better understand. And uh, the structuring of me is due to the fact that I exercise, I manifest, I am in, to the, in the process of manifesting powers, a number of powers like the powers of walking or, or depressing a scale if I mount on it because of my mass or uh, by <coughs> laughing if you do something that is tendentiously uh, funny or so on and so forth. Now, it seems that um, Bill says that uh, powers are uh, have to meet a number of conditions to manifest. But those, for instance, they have, to be, they have to be some reciprocal partners in order for powers to manifest. But it seems very uh, difficult uh, to understand what powers are uh, because we know, and I will put I would like to mention Barbara Vetter's paper, which is very interesting. We know that, for instance, what we consider a rubber band, no? a rubber band, an elastic band, he has two powers, one to, uh, to, to scratch, to, to, I, can, I can't remember stretch. the verb, so stretch, stretch, and the other to re, 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 uh, re un unstretch it to regain its original form. But how much he can stretch? It seems that he has the power to stretch one millimeter or two millimeters or three millimeters, depending on the force. So it's a function actually that he has a function to stretch according to the power, to the force that you exercise on it. So it's it's not something like that you can define the power as the power to bend, to stretch, to do, etc. But there are numbers of functions that are at work when something is uh, uh, under the pressure of some other dispositional part. True, sometimes apparently, for instance, a fragile glass seems to have a all or nothing kind of power that is, it breaks or it breaks not. But if we consider physics, actually fragility is the, the combination of two different uh, functions the torsions 
and pressure on the square, on the centimeter square, something like that. So basically, you can, for instance, you can crush a window not by hitting, but by tor, by moving, the tor by applying some tor torsion on it. So basically, you can crack it, for instance, not crushing it completely. So there is also in this case a number of functions that are in play. But I'm, I'm happy with the view that um, the structuring of people or the life is nothing but that a number of powers acting together. Because I'm, I'm very interested in the power metaphysics. Um, so let's, let's grant this point. Let's <coughs> see what structures are. That it, which is the most difficult thing for me to understand. Um, and uh, in a way, you can see that um, they play two different roles. On one side, they seem to be um, the notion of, with which we have to understand what a substance is. That is, for instance, a we are structure. When, when, I, when I'm crushed, the structure is gone. On the other side, it seems that we have to understand structures also in terms of activities. There is a structure in my launching a baseball or something. That is, it is not, uh, Bill was saying, it would be metaphysically impossible for me to launch a baseball if, by, if, if I'm not doing certain kind of movements. So there seems to be uh, a two roles being played by the notion of structure. But, for instance, are structure just living things? Let's say, let's take a rock, or take a bunch of rocks, and uh, are they structure or are they not? Basically, if we crush them, they're just rock. But at the same time, we see that they perform a number of interesting activities. For instance, consider erosion or earthquake, Italy, they are very uh, important for us. Um, so it seems that we can read what a rock we have by looking at the kind of erosion we are we are con considering. We know that certain kinds of uh, structure in the landscape are b done by limestone, while certain kind of structure in the landscape are done by individual rocks, like. Uh, um, nice or uh, I don't know the name in English, unfortunately. Lignice, um, conoscete Lignice? Lignice, G N A I S S. Nice. Nice, that's the same? Okay, good. Yeah. So we know that it crops in certain ways and it, it's been molded in certain ways because of the, of the chemicals that it has in it. So I wonder. How can we expand, how can, how can we uh, amplify the notion of structure? Because then it seems that everything is a structure. For instance, after all, how about the entire universe? The entire universe is the structure. We can have an interesting idea and twist in this, because the universe is evolving in certain ways because of the reciprocal balance of the masses that we have. We observe the, the spectroscopy of the, the stellars going and fading away from us because of the of the mass that is in this part of the universe with respect to the mass that is in other parts of the universe. So I wonder whether we can understand also the universe as a big structure. Um, so my problem is this, I am a structure or I manifest a human structure. This is a, um, a problem of, say, say of um, fineness of grain of this uh, notion. Because, for instance, uh, uh, structure sometimes has been combined with the notion of novelty of powers. Um, <coughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm saying, yes. For instance, there are certain things that they can do and certain things that they cannot do. But let's suppose there are things that I, that's only me. I am the only one that can do certain kind of things. Does it mean that I have a new kind of power? Because no one else can do this, this kind of things. Let's say that I can uh, imitate perfectly well uh, Emiliano uh, as no one else can. Emiliano cannot Im imitate himself, obviously, because he is Emiliano. 
But I am the best imitator of Emiliano in the world, and then never in the, in the universe there will be any other imitator of Emiliano as me. So I have a new power, the power of being the perfect mimicking of Emiliano. Uh, is the, does it count as a new power? So it would be a self-reflexive self new power that was just instantiated once by, my, by me. Or are we taking the notion of new power to be a new type of power? Let's say that uh, human beings are the only one that manifests the power of being conscious of how their own mental states. So I'm just exhibiting, exhibiting or uh, instantiating this new power, but you can do it as well as a Miliano can do it as well. You can see that these are different kind of uh, uh, views because if the problem is that I am the only one that can manifest this new power, then it seems that we have to understand that the notion of property in terms of tropes that is uh, not as uh, exemplification of something which is abstract there and is uh, realized here, but something that are just here and here and now, and which are properties that are just occurring in the very moment in which they occur, with the feature that they have in the moment in which they occur. And uh, so, in such a case, we have to, we have a different kind of metaphysics behind us, because it's, that says that basically, nothing repeats itself. And the notion of structure then becomes very difficult to understand, because basically, it would be that we have a resembling kind of structure between us where resemblance is, has to be considered as a mm, uh, primitive notion. But it's a verse if we say that, no, no, look, you are just uh, uh, manifesting or you are just uh, um, realizing a property where property is just a universal or something, then it is just us as human that we realize certain kind of properties and the like. So properties, and there will be, in this case, there will be instances that they, we would have to admit something like um, universal. Why I'm suggesting these as a two different views, I mean, why I'm suggesting these are two different views, but why I'm suggesting this as an important and relevant matter for, for the discussion that Jaworski has raised? Uh, because it seems to me that uh, it makes a lot of a difference with respect to the problem, with respect to how we solve it or what we aim to solve the mind problem. Um, because uh, let me just jump <coughs> okay. Uh, because uh, I want to be sure that hymomorphic view is uh, a new game in town. That is uh, it's a theory that is independent from the other theories that we have uh, now um, in the market and uh, on the debate because from one side if we want to say that oh no look you have to just consider the true view of uh, uh, properties then it might be that after all hyomorphism is just uh, uh, repeating uh, uh, it just is a variety of the type identity theory of mind and you know and the bad guys that argue for this kind of theory because it's basically saying, oh look, there is just one specific way in which a power has to be manifested, and that it's manifested by me, and that makes that you identical with the kind of mind that you have. Basically, we would have just uh, different ways of having a mind which are very similar to each other. That's why we believe that we can understand each other, we can communicate each other, something like that. And actually, we are not, or we are not all the way down. Every uh, people that has a wife or a husband knows. And it seems that we are understanding each other. We are just varieties of minds. And so we have to identify my mental and physical properties in this way. Or, if we say that, no, we are just uh, um, realizing, we are just uh, manifesting things that are abstract, more abstract than us, then this, it seems to be some, a form of a qualified functionalism, the, the one that uh, Patman has abandoned uh, since the 70s. Why I'm say a qualified functionalism? Well, um, functionalism is, is the view that um, basically what really counts is the function, is the way in which things are done, not the structure, not the matter, not the, the physical 
uh, a realization of the, the structure. Uh, but functionalism cannot be true like that, for there are many functions that you cannot realize out of anything. Um, say that, for instance, you want to realize a bike, uh, you can do it with uh, aluminum or titanium or whatever, sure, fine. But you cannot do a bike with water, liquid water. There are limits. You, you need to do something which is rigid enough and has certain kind of uh, um, features in order for B to be rolled by a person or something like that. So there are ways in which you have to qualify the function that you want to realize in terms of the, stru the structure or the, the matter, in the, sorry, uh, the matter that you have to use. So the more you qualify the functions that you want, the more the matter that is available for you reduces. My favorite example is the one that uh, Bill has used, that is diamond. If you want to scratch a sapphire, if you want to realize the function of scratching a sapphire, there is only one realizer in this world, is a diamond. There are no other things to scratch a sapphire, because the hardest mineral in the world is a diamond. So the only way in which the functions crushing a sapphire can be realized in this world is by having a diamond. So you can go the opposite. You can say, oh, what is a diamond? Oh, like Bill has done, you know. Oh, it's the kind of um, structure that do this and that, etc., etc. But if you describe the diamond all the way through, then you will arrive sooner or later to something like it scratches a sapphire. But once you have that, then everything else is ruled out. It's the only diamond that does it. So, but, but if you want to go that way, then obviously, whether it's this very diamond or that very diamond doesn't count at all. Because they are realizer of the abstract universal, a diamond, which is individuated by this and this and this and these features. So, you don't need the, the trope view anymore in this case, you, you need uh, something like a universal and instantiation view of properties and relations in such a case. Um, so, my, my problem is, uh, as I said, is hydromorphism a new game in town or not? Um, and as a, as a side problem with respect to the question of uh, mind, body, and in particular, mental properties. Bill has mentioned the, the, the crash man argument. Uh, but consider, let's take, and then I think I'm, I'm sure Bill has a reply, so I'm very curious to know him, his reply. Um, as you know, there is a very much debated question of whether the zombies are possible or not. You know, zombies are people exactly, they are supposedly molecule by molecule identical to us, you know, but they lack conscious states. So by zombie, I, actually I could be by a zombie, actually. I, I'm lazy, I'm lying in my bed, sleeping, and I send my zombie doing the conference. So I'm a zombie. Um, what's the difference? If you crush me or you crush the zombie, exactly the same kind of results. But if you crush me, I feel and I have the feelings, but if you crush the zombie, they didn't have the feelings. So the structuring here, if the structuring is just a matter of organizing physical elements, that is at most a necessary condition, not a sufficient one for individuating what is important. You don't want to say, oh look, we have the, you know, now the bag, the bag has been crushed, then we have just matter, so the structure is gone, because if you crush me or you crush the zombie, then you can and you switch the two bags. You should switch exactly the very same things. So it can't be just the structure. I mean, obviously, you can say, oh, zombie are not possible. And I would be very happy with that, but obviously, we know that there is a big discussion of whether they are possible or not. Uh, yeah, because the uh, people like David Chalmers that argue that they are possible um, base their that the possibility of the conceivability, that is the very intuition. It seems to us that it's perfectly conceivable that there are zombies, that I could be a zombie. 
and it seems to us that this is the case because it seems that there is no contradiction, no contradiction in us in thinking that we are zombie. It seems that we are not running a contradiction. You think, okay, I have the same structure, okay, okay. So we have to attack the very notion of conceivability to block from a zombie. And it seems to me that the crushed man argument is not enough for attacking the notion of conceivability. I think that's done. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. We're going to have 10 minutes pause and then. Yeah, maybe. Okay, sure. Okay. Just okay. 10 minutes. Okay. Just 10 minutes. Okay. Don't be spoiled. No more.